lives within 15 minutes. So Nery Tollwood project, uh, first of all, why, why, why were we doing this? And why are we doing a full-scale Tollwood building test? Um, we look at the, the history of how we build with wood. We, we start with, uh, we start small with stick frame building. This is a picture that uh, I believe either from Nama Parade earthquake or Northridge earthquake. Uh, yeah, life frame wood buildings, they are generally very uh, safe during earthquakes. They get damaged a lot. Uh, because of that, after the uh, Northridge earthquake, people start thinking, can we build them stronger? Uh, and as urbanization comes in, can we build them taller? So a, about 10 years ago, yeah, how time flies. Uh, we started looking at the mid-rise uh, mid wood buildings with live frame wood, which is basically two by four OSB or plywood. Well, we did a full scale test of a six story building on one story of steel, steel uh, podium at the E-Defense Check Table at full scale. So that's called Nice Wood. Um, uh, test. At that point, uh, that's the highest we can go, uh, simply because as everybody in here, you know, engineers and architects, you know that uh, IBC really, you know, if you're building with wood compostable, it is hard to get a higher fire ratings. Uh, some of the building types even prevent you to use combustible material at all. So six stories, how high we can go. But as you all probably know now, the IBC is about to change next year. In the next version, we're going to be able to build in even taller buildings, but not with uh, uh, traditional life frame wood, but uh, tall wood. Uh, the building we see here, if you're familiar with KPFF and Lever Architecture's work, you, you know it's framework. And uh, uh, it is designed and permitted fully in Portland, Oregon, but uh, it was not built because of financial reasons. But the concept is there. The idea is that how can we build tall wood and make them perform even better than the existing uh, building systems we, we have? And then a few pictures here, they're not wood buildings. Most of them concrete uh, frame buildings uh, from Christchurch earthquake. Uh, the building actually in the middle, uh, photographed by one of my uh, colleagues in New Zealand, uh, looks perfectly fine uh, after earthquakes, but if you go into interior, some of the joints, they were, you know, went into plastic mode. It's extremely hard to repair. In fact, uh, some of them can be repaired. You have to demolish the entire building. That really drags down the recovery and resiliency of the urban uh, community. So we first have this idea back all the way 2013, thinking about uh, building resilient uh, tall wood buildings. Uh, we had a, a workshop, gather some consensus. Uh, actually, this is a building uh, in Seattle. It's an Arup uh, office and did some component testing. Then we started this, uh, the project I'm, going to, I'm talking about today with uh, a lot of partners. You can see six university collaboration with a lot of industry partners. Internationally, we're collaborating with FP Innovation and also PTL. Um, then, you know, a lot of researchers from uh, TDI uh, participated in this. So the idea is that we're gonna look at uh, tall wood uh, archetypes, especially from, you know, six to 18 story, see what kind of uh, mass timber building will actually sell in the market. What we find out is that, uh, yeah, if you build uh, with all panels, like uh, the uh, Maple Grove London building, uh, it is very good for residential, uh, like 40 building in Australia. But if you wanna attract a commercial space office, uh, you have to have some kind of open floor plan. So you, you, you will have a wood mass timber gravity system coupled with some sort of a lateral system. Now, actually, some of the buildings has been built like Carbon 12 in Portland, Oregon. It is exactly that concept, but the lateral part of the building is still traditional braced steel frame or for in case of uh, Brooks Commons in UBC, it was a uh, concrete uh, core. So we 
believe that through R&D, we can actually do better with a, a system we call a wood rocking wall. So a lot of people actually, because we have already done a smaller scale two-story test, which I'm gonna show, uh, uh, show in the next slides, Back in uh, 2017, as a proof of concept uh, for the structural system, uh, a lot of people actually look at that uh, rocking wall. They say, hey, that's, a, that's like a steel structure, which I would not, uh, not agree. I would say it is a hybrid solution where you PT a uh, wood rocking wall. This idea is actually not that new. It actually started from New Zealand, but back then they don't use CLT. They use uh, LVL panels. Uh, I, I believe we, we start looking at CLT, we start looking at uh, how to do this rocking wall system, try to um, eventually achieve to a point, maybe earthquake proof, uh, this is a little bit of, uh, you know, eye catching. What we really want to do is make the building damage free, at least structurally, during design level earthquake. And then if you go into MCE and really rare event, we want the building to be repairable so that you don't have to demolish it. So the proof of concept uh, two-story test we, we, we conducted about two years ago, uh, uh, sum, sums up like this. Basically the Nerit Hallwood project, we really were interested in the uh, rocking walls. We, we have like, you see them in the green here. And then our colleagues, uh, uh, Ari Shinha and uh, Andre Bobosa at TDI, the, the really interesting diaphragm. So we have to like span the diaphragm out. And then the shake table is shaking in this direction. So um, I'm gonna just play a video so that you get a good idea of what this building look like. Okay, so now you see how this building are put together and then now let's see how it rocks. So this uh, test I'm going to show you is actually a Northridge earthquake. Uh, we take it uh, 
the recording from the Canoga Park station, which is actually a pretty strong uh, earthquake. And then we run it twice in a row. The reason we want to run it twice in a row is because we want to show the people that uh, during a like North Ridge earthquake, it's kind of a design level, you don't need to repair it at all. So here we go. Uh, so this is the overall view. This is the uh, camera like sitting right at the first story. So yeah, in fact, uh, after the two earthquakes we're getting, uh, the inspection is actually quite boring because you can't find anything. Uh, and then we actually compared the response from those two earthquakes. It is pretty much identical, which means the, the building wasn't get damaged. Uh, that is actually not the largest earthquake we actually do. We, we tested this thing under 14 earthquakes. The last one, we really tried to push the limit. We, we, we scale the, build, the, the motion to MCE and then we can damage it. So we have to do, you know, one, uh, I, I believe 120% of MCE to try to yield some of the PT bars. You can see the PT bars, post-tension bars on there. This is that, that shake. And uh, you see, this is the toe, uh, you know, down corner of the rocking wall, you see a rock. This is on the second floor. So it is uh, pretty scary to be in that building uh, during a large earthquake, but you'll be totally safe. And then even better when the earthquake is down, we actually take it apart and look at the damage. There's not much damage. I, I, I said that, yeah, the PT bar, they yielded, but you can see actually from this figure, we have one, two, three, four, four PT bars for each panel. Uh, only in like one or two yielded. So the repair of this building, actually, you just need to go to the roof and re retention it. And then there's a little bit of bivying on the toe that you just saw, but that's pretty much it. Everything's almost intact. So uh, we gain confidence in doing this test and then we calibrate our model. So next step, we're gonna do a real tall building. So we're to looking at a 10 story building uh, and then we're gonna put it on the shake table. Uh, uh, everything works out for us that uh, the shake table, when you saw the tests on the two-story building is only 1D, which means it moved in one direction, but now it has been updated to 3D. We have to wait a little bit, but uh, I think it's worth it to be the world's largest 3D uh, outdoor shake table. We'll put our building on, and more importantly for this test, we're gonna, uh, try to incorporate some non-structural finishing, exterior wall, facade, and interior will have stairs and piping. Uh, we'll try our best to test this and then look at the resiliency of the entire system, which means both the structural and non-structural. So for structural, we're pretty confident that we're able to do it as you showed on the two-story test. Non-structural, you know, uh, we, we did a lot of uh, uh, fine detailing and adjustment. We'll see what happens. We also use this test to showcase various uh, mass timber products. We're trying to include the MPP, we're trying to include CLT, of course, and also uh, NLT and DLT. Uh, I'm going to talk about that later. The idea is to use at, to, to our best that we can use all the shake table space. You can see the column grid. And then those are the rocking walls we, you saw here. 
Um, and then we're gonna actually use our uh, CLT flow to cantilever out a little bit to give us a little bit more flow space. For the floors, we uh, were intended to do multiple, um, you know, interior finishing types. Uh, we we're trying to uh, mimic some retail relatively open space on the, on the bottom. Uh, look at uh, some office type of space finish on the middle stories and then residential on the top. The design of this building, we selected uh, a hazard corresponding to downtown Seattle. Uh, the, the key, of course, is the lateral system, is the rocking wall we, we talk about. Uh, this wall, just to give you an idea, it's about 10 feet this way and uh, about 110 feet the other way. They're pitted um, using, you know, post tension rod. And then we'll have uh, the uh, U-shaped steel plate to help with uh, energy dissipation. We will do a CLT rocking wall in one direction and MPP uh, rocking wall in the other direction. The Nimitz states really, I mean, in the layman's term, basically we're trying to do the same thing. Uh, only limited uh, cosmetic damage under design level earthquake and repairable damage for the MC earthquake. Okay, so there is a model going through the building without finishing. Already. Um, all right, so uh, basically uh, we have a kind of timeline worked out. In fact, the building for the most part is already been designed. We need to fine tune it to match our release target. Everything's gonna happen uh, towards the end of this year. We'll really start to produce our construction drawings by the end of this year and start procurement process during the spring. Depending on the shake table upgrade the schedule, we will, as soon as they finish upgrading their shake table, we're gonna be on and uh, uh, we we'll start construction. Uh, because of the mass timber, you know, the construction, we, we were working with uh, Swinerton construction. Uh, it estimated that it'll take about two months to finish. Uh, you will see this uh, building at uh, UCSD um, uh, by the end of the year 2021 and we'll hopefully doing some testing in the fourth semester of that time. Uh, we're still trying to look for partners in especially on the non-structural components or building contents because you know sometimes people they put uh, their um, TV or a surgical bed in a shake table building to see how they perform in earthquakes. We can totally do that and uh, um, uh, also, yeah, if you have wood products, you want to donate, we'll find a way to incorporate them if uh, it makes sense. Just contact us and then follow the project's progress at our website here. Um, acknowledgement, of course, you know, your NSF supported this project, USFS supported this project. The two-story test you saw, uh, actually special thanks to our providers, uh, Material, DR Johnson, and uh, you know, Smart Lamp for providing our CLT and you know, Katera and Simpson uh, really helped with the, the two-story test. And then most importantly for the 10-story, we have our strategic partner partners, our design team with industry collaborators, suppliers, and then I put an and here. So yeah, 
yeah, if you're interested, put your name in there, and then we're working with Swinerton to construct it. All right, that's that's all, all, I, ha all I have. Thank you, Evan. Yeah, thanks, Dr. Pei. Yep. Uh, um, all right, well, for uh, expediency, we will move on to uh, Dr. Simpson, if you don't mind uh, kicking it up, and we'll do uh, Q&A at the end. If you have any questions for Dr. Pei, you can go ahead and put them in the chat box, uh, or you can save them for the end if we have time. Yep, thank you. I'll stick to the end. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. And, and am I sharing my screen? Yeah, looks good. Okay, great, great. Yeah, I should be used to this online teaching, like week, week, week two, almost week two. Um, so uh, I, I actually got lucky that I'm going second because I feel like a lot of the topics that I'm about to go through were, were explained in the previous presentation. So that's, that's really lucky. Um, I'm gonna be talking about some uh, innovative lateral force resisting systems that we've been, we've been thinking about testing here at OSU. Um, and this work is part of a project led by Ari Sina. Um, Andre Barbosa is also on that team. And then we have several um, graduate students and a postdoctoral scholar who have really been involved in this work. Um, but I will try to present it to the best of, of my ability. Um, so just to start out with, oh, it's not, it's not going forward. Oh, um, so as was presented in the, the last presentation is uh, we're seeing this push towards more resilience, more resilient buildings, um, thinking about post-earthquake uh, losses and repairs, um, and really thinking about uh, the, the impact that the loss of a structure can have on our community uh, and our urban environment. Uh, at the same time, we're seeing this growth in, in the mass timber industry, uh, which is really pushing rather innovative structural systems, um, and as well as offering a sustainable alternative to a lot of the materials. Uh, that we typically use for a lot of the, the construction in, in seismic seismic zones. Um, and so what we've been thinking about at Oregon State is the that this this sort of development of an idea that is by no means new. Uh, in fact, my background is in a lot of steel construction, so you're about to see a ton of pictures of steel buildings, which I think is is great for a mass timber meetup. Um, but but uh, we sort of had this inspiration of developing a family of lateral force resisting systems that we're calling spine systems um, in order to achieve sort of enhanced performance objectives um, and sort of reduce losses and repairs after, after a seismic event. Um, so I'm gonna be talking about these spine, spine systems today. Uh, and so first, I'm just gonna start out by introducing a problem. So this was a, a wood test by the, the Nice Soft Wood Project, not tested by me. I stole this video off of YouTube, um, but it introduces a very uh, specific point, and that's that many buildings, not only wood buildings, are prone to story mechanisms. And so you saw in this particular video that there was a story mechanism that, burned, that, that occurred on that first story, all the damage was concentrated there, and then it subsequently led to the collapse of, of this particular test specimen. Um, and so now I'm gonna move into to my SEAL background, so I, I duly apologize. But we can think of this sort of story mechanism response as being um, sort of a behavior mood that we see in a lot of different structural systems. For example, here I have a brace frame uh, subjected to some sort of inertial loading, some sort of lateral loading, um, and, and there's gonna be some sort of inelastic behavior and what you tend to see in a lot of these systems that exhibit story mechanisms is upon the initiation of inelastic response, um, unless there's some sort of mechanism to distribute that, those inelastic demands to the other stories of the system, what you'll get is this concentration of the demands, this concentration of damage uh, that we're calling story mechanism, um, story mechanism behavior. And so, what, what's, what's the issue with this system, as you saw it in the last slide, is that because of this great concentration of demand, you're putting all these demands on a single story or a few stories. You're not properly utilizing the entire lateral force resisting system. And so it could lead to the collapse like we saw in the previous video. Um, and so the concept of this spine is what if you could take this story mechanism response, which this figure on the left is showing as 100% of the damage in a single story. What if you were able to distribute it across multiple stories? So if we have this six story building here, the figure on the left shows a story mechanism where 100% of the damage is concentrated in a single story. This, this second figure is showing what if you got a sixth of that damage distributed across all the stories? 
Um, and, and we think that we can do this through, the, through this sort of spines concept, which, which is not new and is heavily used in these other materials, in this case, seal. Um, and so the idea of a spine is saying, let's take our inelastic demands that are developing under the earthquake and let's redistribute them vertically. Um, and by doing that, we actually gain a lot of design flexibility. So now we can start thinking about moving, uh, in this case, the braces around, but we can also start thinking about having mass or stiffness irregularities and the spine is going to compensate for that and really just distribute the demands. And so we can think architecturally that we can do a lot of interesting things if we were to implement the spine. Um, and so the end, the end game of this sort of spine-like concept is that we're getting increased design flexibility. And so like I said, my background is in SEAL and my and so I, I'm apologizing for all these. These are all pictures that I took, um, but we can start thinking about the design flexibility sort of uh, presenting itself in a number of different ways. This is a building in Tokyo, Japan. And so we can think of that spine actually allowing us to go taller. Um, this is a building in Berkeley, California. And so they were actually able to use a spine to eliminate the number of braced bays in this particular building. And so they had less, uh, less braced bays. And then this is the Gigafactory uh, in, Reno, in Reno, Nevada. Um, Nevada is what I should say. Uh, and there was a number of uh, mass irregularities in this building. It was one of the battery factors, factories for, for Tesla. Um, and so they were able to compensate for the sort of uncertainty in where the loading was by using these sort of spine systems. Um, now, the spine systems are kind of similar. They're part of the family of the systems that was, that was shown in the last presentation when we were looking at sort of a rock, rocking, uplifting system, but it could also be something with a pinned base like you're seeing here. Um, here's another building just to say that it's not all steel. So you could, this is another building in Japan where you have a concrete wall that's actually on a very, very elegant pin. And then between this, this wall, which is the spine and the remaining gravity system, what you're going to see is, is something to dissipate the energy. And I believe this is my last slide on materials that are not related to mass timber. And so this all leads to the idea of if you can do it in concrete and seal, then of course you can start thinking about it in terms of a number of different ways. And so like I said earlier, we can think of sort of spines as just being the elastic vertical component in a family of systems. And so on the left here, I have a wall-like system that could be concrete as it's shown like here. Uh, in this middle figure, we have sort of a rocking uplifting system that's actually able to uplift about its base. And then on the right, you have this sort of what we're calling a pivoting sort of spine system where you have the, the, the spine pivoting about a pinned base. And so, I don't know if anybody was able to go to the last meetup, but there was this really fabulous building that was presented by KPFF, the Catalyst Building, and we're starting to see that that not only can these spine, the spine sort of concept, which was, which has been around for several years, um, it, it can have, it can actually apply to mass timber as well. And so here we can have a, a mass timber wall. Uh, BRB is about the base that control the overturning moment, much like that, that, that pin is, is sort of eliminating uh, the moment about the base. Um, and then we can start thinking about sort of combining, hybridizing uh, steel energy dissipators, in this case a buckling strain brace, with say a primarily mass timber gravity and, and, and spine system. Um, and so the concept behind the test that we're doing at OSU uh, is that mass timber and hybrid, hybrid systems, and by hybrid systems, I mean predominantly mass timber system with steel energy dissipating components, are, are uniquely positioned to foster innovation. Um, and that's because they're relatively new to the building scene. Uh, and so we can really think about pushing the envelope in ways that we haven't really been able to do with concrete or steel. Um, and so, if all, everything else I was talking about was the inspiration from other building materials, uh, we can start thinking about the mass timber wall being either some sort of CLT or MPP wall. In this case, one that rocks about its base. It could be post tension to allow it to self center. So we have basically very little residual drifts following some sort of seismic event. And then we have some sort of energy dissipation mechanism. And here I'm showing just small BRBs at the base of the wall. Um, we can also redefine what it means to have a, a, a spine uh, in our system. We could redefine it as something that pivots, say, about a pinned base. 
Um, so on, if the figure on the left is what I'm calling a rocking wall or an uplifting wall, this figure on the right is what I'm calling a, a pivoting a pivoting wall or pivoting spine. And so in this case, the, the wall itself is the spine. It can be made out of MVP or CLT. Uh, and then at the base, you would have some sort of pin. And then to dissipate the energy, you could either use UFPs, you could use the BRBs. There's a number of different energy dissipation mechanisms that you would think of using for this particular system. And so um, the components, as I stated previously, could, could be thought of in a number of different ways. For our project, we've been primarily thinking of our energy dissipation as being through UFPs, which is sort of like a U-shaped uh, plate that's that's curved that um, yields to dissipate energy, or we could think about it as some sort of buckling restrain brace about the base of the wall, similar to what was used in the catalyst building. Uh, we also can think about what that pin at the base of the wall might look like. Uh, this isn't from our test, but this is this is a, a, a test. I have some of the citations below we might think about what doing what to do to sort of pin the base of the wall um, and then finally clt is probably uh one of the ones that's most well known but we can we can also start thinking about using mpp for for these spine systems um, and so we had a, a unique opportunity here at osu uh, we have a, a brand new laboratory and there was an opportunity to do a signature test um, and so what what the team that I'm working with envisioned was that we could do a two by two bay uh, structural test where we could test both the gravity system and the spine system um, here, here at Oregon State. And so I'm just showing these figures on the right, sort of a three dimensional view. And so in concept, what we could do is take, or what we have done is, is we can take a building and then that two bay by two bay test is gonna be a cutout of this building. And so this red arrow is sort of indicating the direction of, uh, that we're going to be testing the specimen with um, and so we're going to have a wall spine system that we can swap out and so the gravity system is basically going to remain for each subsequent test but then we can test a number of different spines um, as well as the gravity system around it and then that that spine is going to be sequestered in between two collar beams and then we'll also include these out of plane stabilizing walls to sort of look at out of plane effects um, on, on walls or spines that are not necessarily oriented in plane to the direction of loading. Um, and so the testing program consists of that sort of pivoting spine concept uh, that I sort of open this presentation with. We'll also be looking um, at a, a MPP rocking or uplifting wall that will have self-centering and UFPs. And then we'll also be looking at a more traditional uh, MPP wall um, with the sort of standard connections and things of that nature. And then of course, plus uh, a mass timber gravity system. And so I'm gonna just show on this left, I'm focusing on these pivoting spines, which again is that spine that has a pin about the base, which allows it to pivot back and forth. And so we can mitigate sort of that story mechanism response that, that I showed at the beginning of the presentation and really offer a little bit more design flexibility. And so we're, we're gonna be do, doing our spine in MPP. We also need to dissipate some sort of energy under the, the earthquake. And so we're including buckling restrained braces, much like the catalyst building um, at the base of this wall. And then finally, something that makes this at least a little bit in my mind unique is that um, instead of allowing it to rock, rock or uplift about its base, it's actually pinned about the base. And so what we're seeing is that it pivots about this pinned point. Um, and then finally, the, the gravity system itself, which is, which is LVL and then a, an eight inch MPP slab. Um, and, and finally, because this is an opportunity and it's a rather large test, we don't have to just test the structural systems. And so similar to the Tallwood team, what we're also looking at is a deformation controlled non-structural components. Uh, and what I'm showing here is this nested track system um, for partition walls. And, and this is actually, uh, this, this was based on input from the Tallwood team. Um, and finally, if the previous presentation showed the 10 story shaking table test uh, at UC San Diego, the final sort of uh, last, I don't know, what's a good word? I wanna say hurrah, but Maybe it's too late in the day to use that. Uh, the last sort of, uh, yeah, I can't think of a good word, but, but finally we'll be taking the 10 story tall wood test and deconstructing it. Um, there's basically a segment in, in, their, in their rocking wall. And so we can make that, their 10 story test a six story test. And then we are hoping to, to test that at UC San Diego um, after, after they've completed their testing. Um, and so thank you for your time.
as usual, I probably talked way too fast, but I'd like to acknowledge the, the many people who have sort of been participating on this project, uh, most specifically the project team that I've been working with. They've just been really fantastic. And the students on this project are just, just really great. Um, and with that, I'll hand it back over to you, Evan. Thank you, that was great. Um, yeah, and uh, we'll save questions for the end uh, today. So with that, we will move to Dr. Riggio, if you would like to take the reins. Can you see my screen now? Yes. You're in. Uh, you're not in present mode, though. Now. Yeah, it looks good. Okay. Um, okay. So we have seen extremely interesting research investigating how mass timber systems behave in case of uh, extreme events, seismic loads. Our research aims to provide an understanding of uh, the long-term performance of uh, these systems, and specifically of mass timber self-centering rock and shear walls. We plan to develop guidelines for the design, construction, and maintenance of these systems, and in particular, to, uh, this work aims to compare alternative mass timber shear wall materials, de design details, and installation procedure, and then communicate recommendations to you, to the, the architecture, engineering, construction industry. So this is a uh, is moving by itself, but <laughs> this is a multi-tier study, uh, which includes a review of state of the art encompassing a thorough review of design guides, standards, scientific publications, review of construction plan sets, and visual inspection of constructed buildings, and also a comparison of data from monitored post-tension timber wall buildings. Uh, we will have a series of experimental tests at the material assembly and system scale and numerical studies that will be used to develop predictive models of the long-term performance of these systems. Um, re regarding the data available at the building scale, it is worth mentioning that there are three uh, post-tension timber buildings instrumented to monitor long-term performance the Nelson Malware Institute of Technology and MIT uh, in Nelson, New Zealand, with data that are however partially uh, available. The Trimble building, which has been monitored since 2014, and PDO at OSU, monitored since the beginning of construction. Uh, we will take a look at some of this data today and reflect on uh, lesson learned so far. In the meanwhile, what information and tools that uh, that the design community have available. The most updated uh, published recommendation and design guide uh, dates back to 2015. It's a three-part New Zealand design guide for post tension timber buildings. It is an important reference for lateral and gravity design of these buildings, but lacks guidance regarding some details. Um, in addition, uh, it does not include the most recent knowledge gained uh, after seven and years of implementation and research. So in these years, we have definitely learned more about the seismic behavior of this building and more we, learn to, we need to learn, especially when we go high, as uh, we have seen with uh, Lynn and, um, and Barbara uh, presentation. So um, as we have already seen in previous presentation, the design of these systems is aimed at maximizing energy dissipation potential while retaining the ability of, uh, to recenter the system during uh, lateral loading. However, these benefits could be drastically reduced by post tensioning losses. Indeed, uh, tension loss is a key indicator uh, of long term performance of shear walls. And these uh, tension losses can occur during construction. These are immediate tension losses, such as those occurring during sequential tensioning when multiple loads are present in a single wall, may be affected by localized strain and stress distribution in uh, mass timber elements, depend on the uh, reinforcement, uh, reinforcement ratio, um, which varies with types of engineered wood panels uh, in the walls. Short-term uh, tension losses may depend on construction activities and tensioning procedure. And then we have long-term losses that may depend on relaxation of the steel roads, creep, 
deferred deformation under constant loads, and mechanosoptive creep affected by moisture changes in the wood material, and also shrinkage of the mass timber panels. So although uh, tension losses vary, estimating immediate losses in constructed uh, post-tension timber buildings have ranged about, uh, from about 8% to 12%, and um, expected tension losses for uh, this system have been uh, estimated uh, approximately 3% for short-term and 12% for long-term losses over a 50-year lifespan, according to the New Zealand Design Guide. In this research, we investigate some design, fabrication, construction, and in-service parameters that can affect tension losses, such as the influence of material types used for the shear wall panels, details of the top anchorage, the presence of uh, internal versus external roads, and in the former case, the possible weakening effects of the internal chases, the level of initial tensioning, and also, to a certain extent, also the sequence of tensioning and the effects of retensioning. And we are also interested in understanding the influence of the environmental condition since the change of relative humidity and temperature can affect properties of the wood and the steel. In terms of types of material of the shield wall panels, uh, three types of engineered wood products have been used in constructed buildings so far. Radiata pine LVL was used in the first building uh, featuring the post tension shield wall, the M M uh, MIT, erected in 2011, and following buildings. Uh, as for instance, the Carlton Event Center and the Trimble Building, also in New Zealand. In the Kaikura District Council building, um, the walls are made of a hybrid panel with a lamination in the vertical direction made of MVL and the transversal direction with lumber. PV Hall has uh, Douglas Fir CLT panels um, when, that are manufactured by Deere Johnson uh, with thickness varying from five to seven plies. And as you have learned from the previous presentation, MPP uh, promised to be a valuable alternative to the previously used uh, engineered products for high-rise post-tensioned system. But in what terms can the difference in these materials affect long-term performance and tension loss? LVL is a veneer-based panel with all the fibers connected along the same direction. MPP is also made of veneers that differently from uh, the elimination of permits groups of veneers and prosthetic veneers to provide dimensional stability. While CLT is a lumber based panel with cross layer lamination. Uh, why these differences are important? Uh, because time and the dimensions in wood depend on the direction of the load with regards to the grain orientation and are higher across the grain. So the information that we have in terms of creep behavior from the first building used in um, with post tension shear walls in New Zealand will not correctly depict the behavior of cross laminated timber or veneer based panels such as CLT and MPP, which apparently will be the more used uh, options in the US. Additionally, creep varies um, among wooden species, and the data that we have from the buildings in New Zealand refer to radiata pine and not Douglas fir. Some important design detailing, such as the anchorage where the pit and the post tension roads meet the wall, can affect localized stress concentration in the mass timber elements. This location requires adequate stiffness as well as bearing and shear capacity to account for post tension loads. Um, top anchorage details uh, seen in built structures typically consist in steel bearing plates, so it's which should cover the entire thickness of the timber panel. This is where not always the case, uh, as we have seen, uh, uh, for instance, in PD Hall. What we expect is that the smaller anchorage plate affects uh, CLT more than LVL, as the bearing area reduction um, from can, uh, can cause um, the lamination. So it's um, basically in its uh, interest, especially uh, the it, it excludes the lamination parallel to the grain that is the stiff and stronger material. Um, so another, um, another aspect of this detail is the thickness of the plate that influences stiffness. In various implemented projects, we have seen that this detail varies even within the same building. All walls typically contains four steel post tensioned bars inserted internally into the panel with an arrangement that depends on the thickness of the panel. Fabrication of internal rectangular chases in CLT panel is a relatively easy task. 
This is generally done by replacing the board corresponding to the chase location with a material that can be removed once the panel is pressed. However, this task is not the same, it's not so easy for LVL. Due to the difficulties to laminate LVL leaving internal chases, um, in the M M MIT, uh, the opening for the roads were modified to one large opening for multiple roads. And we believe that this detail is one of the causes that has led to the tension losses recorded in that building. It is worth noting that openings for internal roads should be minimized without compromising the ability of roads to rotate during an event. The difficulties of fabricating panels with openings for internal post tensioned roads is one of the reasons why more recent de designs, such as the, the one of the framework project, opted for external roads. In our project, we will test both configuration. Installation procedures, and in particular the value of the initial post tension force, the sequence of tensioning and retensioning, play an important role in immediate short and long term losses. In our research, we will contribute to understand more on the, on the influence of these factors on the long-term performance of the walls. To determine the initial force, the design has a recent innovation, basically estimates the necessary force to be sent to the wall for the, tension, the, the design earthquake. And this uh, initial post-tension force should consider, among other factors, the immediate losses due to the sequential tensioning as well as short and long-term tension losses. As I said, estimated tension losses are available for designers, and based on these estimates, the design uh, force, post-tension force, includes an allowance for 12.5% tension, uh, tension loss over a 50-year building lifespan. However, monitoring data available for the three uh, buildings that I've shown have highlighted higher losses than those estimated, and we will see this in a minute. It is worth mentioning that um, the design guidelines recommend tensioning the roads twice. However, there is no clear indication of when and how this should happen. For instance, the navigation building roads were tensioned at first at road insertion and then after all the energy dissipation devices and connection being in play, while in PV the tensioning procedure was initially performed just once. However, thanks to the lot set that I installed send on the fourth was in PV, we could see that within 24 hours tension losses were up to 8%, which is more than double the estimated short term losses. We think that this immediate losses were caused by sequential tension of roads, but also by doing certainly localized deformations and constructive activities. So this information were shared with the contractors and eventually the walls were retentioned. Our monitoring data also highlighted a positive correlation of retention loss and retention in order, which definitely requires further investigation. Short-term losses from the three monitoring building uh, show that the, just the three building is the, the three structures the one that has losses near the expected loss according to the industry and the design values. And one of the hypotheses that we have from the reasons of higher losses in PD and MMIT uh, building is the use of the detail that, that was the thickness of the wall and therefore smaller varying areas, but there are a lot of unknown um, on, the, you know, on the real conditions of this building. And this is one of the reasons why we will uh, conduct also um, more experiments in a controlled environment. So finally, environmental conditions. During construction in series, uh, these conditions can heavily influence tension losses due to the effects of temperature on steel elongation and stress relaxation and effects of temperature and especially relative humidity on wood time deferred deformation. While environmental conditions during construction can be very variable, we expect that on the long term, this stabilizes when the building is climatized. And yes, we know that mass timber is used in protected environments, which however does not necessarily mean environments with steady environmental condition the case of Spring Creek parking garage featuring post tension shield walls protected from the weather but not enclosed in a building envelope is paradigmatic of how it is important to consider also the climatic condition in service, taking into account both uh, in our design and maintenance plans. 
to address all this question, we have been experimental program and we'll test Anchorage details, evaluate effects of constant and fluctuating climatic conditions on a small scale uh, post tensioned walls. We will also test large scale CLT and MPP shield walls in the TDI's Emerson lab to determine the behavior of these systems in uh, uncontrolled climate conditions. And of course, we will keep analyzing monitoring data from the static building. I want to acknowledge our partners. And of course, I want to thank my research team. Um, so this is a collaborative effort of the OSU College of Forestry and College of Civil and Construction Engineering. Thank you. All right, great, thank you. Yeah, sorry, we had a little trouble with the mic. Um, so sorry if some of that didn't get caught. Um, but maybe in the uh, Q&A session here, we'll be able to answer any questions that might have arisen from the, the mic issues. Um, so yeah, thank you. Thank you to all three of our speakers. I uh, really appreciate you taking the time to share your projects with us. We have, we have at least six minutes until five. Uh, so we would love to take questions at this point. You can, you can just directly ask a question to any of the presenters. And if uh, folks want to stay a little bit after five, that, uh, that also works. So at this point, um, I will open the floor to anyone with a question and um, I'll start looking through some of the questions that have been posed in the chat room. So. So Looks I apologize like, for the- We can start with uh, Gabriella's. We can start with Gabriella's question. Um, he, his first question was regarding the 10 story test. So uh, this may be for Dr. Pei. Uh, will the rocking happening uh, will be happening just at the base of the press lamb, or were you thinking also at the segmental rocking with multiple rocking interfaces? Uh, yeah, so f uh, f the the base one with just one uh, segment, uh, traditional rocking, I personally think uh, 10 story might be it's kind of its limit because the higher mode effect would we'll definitely test that. There is a plan to uh, insert a intermediate rocking joint where we can lock up and release. Uh, that detail we, we still have to figure out uh, with uh, with uh, with that detail. But yeah, that that's part of the plan. But uh, I would say single segmental rocking is hundred percent, and then segmental rocking we're seriously consider doing it. Um, and I guess the second to that part. Yeah. Sorry, it sounds Barbie. You're going to say something there. Oh, I, yeah, because I, I see a second part to that question. So it's, it see, appears to be pointed towards me. I think. Mm -hmm. um, okay. oh, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so, so the question says regarding the pivoting wall, does uh, the U.S. building code have any limitation on interstellar drift at small intensity earthquake, for example, uh, fifty-year return period? And it's a great question. I mean, it's anything that any typical stiffness requirements you would have for any other building would still come into play here. Um, so in the elastic range, for example, those BRBs that are controlling the overturning moment, in the elastic range, like you're treating it like an elastic system, of course, once it yields, like then you have a dramatic change of stiffness that sort of lets it, lets it potentially displace more. Um, I'm actually, uh, that is a concern as far as the stiffness. I would be more con concerned with the, the the higher mode effects that, that were actually just brought up. Um, so what you have is you have a spine and you've sort of eliminated this ability to form a story mechanism. And so what you're gonna see is your accelerations are gonna, gonna be amplified because of that. Not amplified, that's probably the incorrect word, but they're gonna be larger than you would, what you would get if you had um, a building that was able to form a story me mechanism. So uh, my, my uh, a greater concern is you know, balancing uh, sort of a, a more frequent earthquake and, and having mainly elastic behavior for a frequent earthquake, but then for rarer events, uh, like seeing where that non-structural damage really starts to accumulate. And that's when the segmented rocking wall really becomes helpful. It sort of reduces those higher mode acceleration effects. So I hope that answers your question. Thank you very much. It answers very well. Um, okay, okay. So, sorry if I, if I yeah, uh, I was just curious because I, I work a little bit with Preslam both walls and, and frames. And one of the problems where we were having with Preslam frames was that the serviceability limit state was a little bit of an issue. So 
In New Zealand, the limitation we have, I think, is 0.3% interest rate drift for a 50 years return period there quick. And that was a little bit of a challenge to not activate the rocking motion for low intensity earthquakes. Right. So I, I was curious because the concept of the spine seems very, very interesting and fascinating. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Good luck. Yeah. For, yeah. For yeah. And I, I mean, like, and, and, and what you could potentially do, like, you're going to see, you're going to see yielding at around what you said, 0 0.3 to 0 0.5%. Um, and so, so then you have a, a story drift problem potentially. Um, but, so you need to, you need to think about that and then getting enough stiffness considering it's, you, you like for the BRBs, it's in the vertical direction. And then even with shear, uh, shear links or, you know, butterfly fuses or whatever you're activating in terms of shear, like you have to make sure that you have enough stiffness there. Um, yeah, I had, I, I think I was going somewhere with this, but I totally lost my train of thought. Um, I'm losing my train of thought. I'm sorry. <laughs> No, this thanks, is, thanks this very much. This is what well. happens when you, when you, this is, yeah, first week of teaching online, everyone. So please, please give me a little bit of a break. I think I did have a comment, but I don't, I don't remember what it was. I'm sorry. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Barbara, this is Ian. I had a question about the spines project. Um, did you say that you're using LVL panels for the floor, floor panels? And no, no. Yeah, oh. so the, the beams and columns are LVL, and then the, the floor, the, the, I, I've been calling it a slab, rightly or not, um, is MPP. Okay. Yeah. What, what's the reason for using LVL for the beams and columns? Donations. Oh. Yeah, thanks, Ari. I think he's on this call. Well, uh, not to say <laughs> that, but it's just, um, well, there's, um, so LVL is also, uh, a mass timber element, right? So, and nothing has been tested. So that was one of the reason. The other reason was it would be a parity of material. Both are veneer based, and we are not using anything other than that. So, plus we have good relationship with Boise Cascades. Oh, I'm sorry. I remembered my comment to the previous one. Um, I apologize. Um, so, so, and, and I'm not very familiar with the, the design methods in New Zealand, but it sounds like if you're designing for multiple hazard levels, you have more of a performance-based design strategy. ASC 7, as it's written, doesn't really include that. What we do is we design for, for a design level earthquake, and then we assume that we're gonna get collapse prevention at the maximum considered earthquake event, rightly or not. Um, and so a lot of these mass timber systems, like we can start to think about pushing the envelope in, in terms of designing for multiple performance levels. Um, so I'm sorry, that was what I was gonna say and I don't know why I blanked on that. So apologies about that. I, had a, I was kind of curious, uh, uh, laying about your project, you mentioned that there was going to be non-structural finish in this project, whereas you didn't have that in the two-story test. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering, like, I, I imagine that would have impacts on, um, like, I guess, like vibration and sort of stuff like that. But in terms of like high order seismic activity, like, does that little amount of added mass, uh, mass affect the performance of the test much? Or like, what is the purpose of adding all the non-structural components to that? Uh, it is mostly for um, it is mostly for resiliency targets for the non-structural damage. Just like uh, Barb uh, is planning to put some like drywall in the story story draw story test, it is more of a, not that they will affect the performance of a structural system, but uh, is uh, the structural system gonna deform whatever drift uh, it will deform, and we need to detail those. So that they don't fall down and uh, you know crash on people, or they don't get damaged uh, to the degree that they won't get repaired. What is done right now, for the most part, I mean, if you think about uh, you know interior non-load bearing wall, yeah, people just uh, you know tape them and then they put them in, and then when earthquake games, the the code actually for design level earthquake, you can actually deform to you know. One to two percent. I don't remember the exact number, but a lot of those non-structural systems they will get heavily damaged at that drift, which will render your building um, non-functional at least for you know a month or two. 
So yeah, that, that's a purpose. It's uh, less of uh, what they will do to the structure system, but uh, more of what the structure system uh, and then the deformation demand gonna do to them and how do we uh, optimize their connections to avoid that. The, uh, and another thing that the non-structural system, uh, with that said, the non-structural system will have some impact on the structural performance. A uh, perfect example is a uh, life frame wood wall. If you put uh, all the drywall, although they are not considered structural, but they will affect your stiffness greatly, at least uh, before they crack. So I don't think uh, anyone know like very for sure what's, what, how much they're gonna do to the mass timber system, especially when we have a rocking wall system that is new. So that's another thing we're gonna keep an eye on. So. Right. Yeah, Lex, Lex seems to be concerned that uh, things are going to be flying off the building in all directions. So he's very. Right. Um, and, and also, I, I, I think because a lot of non structural system, including envelope, gonna we, we're gonna we're gonna have to rely on donations to do it. So it is likely we're not gonna. I, I, I it is unlikely that we're gonna do the entire building. So we'll we'll probably select different stories. So if uh, if like say some. Um, sponsor, which is also collaborator, they want to test their product in, in like one story that can be a dedicated story, or even sometimes like uh, in terms of the facade, you actually need uh, maybe three stories in a row to actually see the effect. So we, yeah, we will plan to do that. See what what uh, uh, what kind of a collaboration we can we can find out. Great, thank you. Obviously, we're uh, we're five minutes past our, our target deadline. So if uh, any of the presenters, if you need to leave, um, please feel free. Thank you for, for uh, coming and presenting with us. Uh, if you'd like to stick around and uh, chat and answer questions, if there are any, um, obviously, that's great. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it open for the next five, 10 minutes max. Um, but yeah, just want to thank everybody for coming. So if you have a question, feel free to throw it out there. Does that mean I can leave or is that I? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, that was a little vague. Yeah, if you need to leave, please feel free. And, uh, and yeah, thanks. Okay. thanks. Yeah, yeah, I apologize. I, I, I was supposed to post some things for class that I haven't, I haven't done yet. So I'm gonna, I think. but uh -oh. thanks, this is great. This is great. Yeah, yeah, thanks. And I'll, uh, I'll be posting a recording of this meetup. Uh, next time I reach out to the group uh, with our next meetup, I'll send a link. So uh, that'll be out in the ether, so. Great. Great. Well, yeah, maybe. Uh, uh, Amanda was. Uh, Did you say that you're going to be posting this presentation? <clears throat> Sorry. Yeah, I'll be posting the presentation. So uh, we have links set up through our website, uh, tallwoodinstitute.org. Uh, but I'll also send out a, a message to the meetup group if you're part. And of then the those those links will be available to anyone who wants to watch them. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry, uh, Maria Powell, you were saying something. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> wow. I don't know why you couldn't hear what I was presenting. <laughs> yeah, we had some kind of connectivity issue. I'm, I'm sorry. It was uh... strange. Okay. Well, there was a question regarding tension losses in the monitoring building. Um, so what I, um, so the, 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 the main message I think is uh, what we have compared so far is the, um, the first six months, um, the first months, uh, just to make it comparable with, uh, um, with the, um, the performance in PDO. And we have seen that in general, there are short-term losses that are higher than what expected, what predicted by the, the uh, design guidelines, uh, especially in, uh, in case of PV and uh, in the and the MIT building. And we uh, think that this is uh, in part due to the, some specific details, uh, such as the um, bearing plate, the anchorage detail. And, um, and this is also the reason why we are uh, planning to do more tests to understand this short-term effects and then definitely also uh, the long-term performance. 
uh, our data and the data from uh, the Trimble building are still available. I mean, they are, we are keeping uh, collecting data and uh, we can share this data too, at least from our building. Yeah, we're going to have a really full lab uh, not long from now. So that three-story test that uh, Dr. Simpson was talking about and uh, the test walls that Maria Pala, Dr. Richard was talking about are all going to be in the Emerson lab like within the next half year. So it'll be interesting. If you will have the recording of this uh, meetup, um and the audio will be uh, still, so I imagine, uh, very bad. We can try to <laughs> share some pub you know, published uh, information instead, if this can be useful. We have a couple of articles that are related to this project that can be um, definitely shared with interested. Um, yeah. yeah, I think that's a great idea. Um, when I send out a, a message to the group, um, I was thinking of just sending a link to your project page, but maybe we can link to a couple articles as well. So. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. Well, any uh, any final questions before we log off? Anybody got a pressing, urgent question here? All right. Well, I'll take that as a... Uh, as a no, and I will take that opportunity to thank you guys once more. And uh, yeah, we'll see you next week. Um, yeah, as subscribe to the meetup messages. We'll send you all the information about what's coming up that way. So hopefully we'll see you guys a week from now. Thank you, Evan. Bye. Yeah, thanks everybody.